Well, I have a specific message that God has laid on my heart for you. And this message comes out of my own challenges over the last two years. And what I would like for you to do, I'd like for you to go back with me about two years ago in March of 2020. Now, I know that's pretty painful for most of us. But I want you to remember what it was like in those first few months when COVID hit. I remember in our area watching so many followers of Jesus roll up their sleeves with families that had lost their jobs and Christians or followers of Jesus were on the front lines. They were serving groceries to people who had no income. I watched people who were opening their computers to host small groups. And there were so many people that were praying over others on Zooms and video chats. I remember watching parents that were working so hard to do school online. Anybody remember how hard that was? And there was so much pouring out. There were so many followers of Jesus where the church collectively across the world was rising up in a crisis and standing strong. And I remember there was a moment I was sitting on a Zoom with our staff and just, we were praying for our city together and there were tears flowing down my face just thinking, God, thank you for your local church. Thank you for how your church is standing in the midst of crisis. Now, we all kind of would hope that that would be the tone for two straight years, but a lot of people over the two years, we noticed patterns that started to set in. There were a lot of people that started to struggle with anger, and there were others who started to deal with loneliness because they had been by themselves in their home. There were so many other people that then began to struggle with anxiety and depression and in the midst of this, there were good people, people who had started out in this crisis doing good work, that in the midst of it, there was an exhaustion that began to set in. There was a tiredness and a weariness that so many people who were trying to do good things began to experience. And there was another pattern that emerged that I began to see in our church, and I began to see in so many of my friends' lives that there were good people who started with good intentions but over the course of the two years, they began to give up on the things that God had asked them to do. I watched people that had been married for three decades and call it quits on a marriage that God had asked them to give their heart and soul to. I watched so many people in the local church decide, I'm, I'm done with church, I, I'm not gonna continue to be faithful with my engagement in my local church. I watched so many other people that gave up on careers and callings that God had given to them. And maybe today you are listening to my voice and you feel that tension, that there's an exhaustion or there's a tiredness or a weariness that is set in in the midst of this season. And God has sent me here today to give you a word of hope and a word of encouragement that no matter how hard it is, there is a way forward for you, that you can be the kind of person who shows up where it matters most. So today's message is titled, Three Good Reasons to Keep Showing Up. If you have your outline, I wanna invite you to pull it out. And we're gonna to journey together through a few verses in the Bible. These few verses for me personally, I would say are the verses that God has used the most to encourage me over these last two years. And in particular, one of these verses, I hope it will sink into your heart to encourage you today. In Galatians chapter six, the apostle Paul is writing, now, it's good to recognize this letter that was written to the church in Galatia. Paul was writing this letter to help them understand the grace of God. He wanted them to know that regardless of what they had done in the past, regardless of their brokenness, that because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there was hope that they could be free from the power of sin and death, that they could have a relationship with God that wasn't based on religion or performance, but they could have a relationship with God that was based on grace through faith. So Paul describes this all throughout the book of Galatians. But then at the end of the book, Paul gets into this concept of personal responsibility and obedience. And he wants them to understand, and for us today, this is God's truth for us, that grace does not abdicate us of personal responsibility. Grace is not an opportunity to disobey God. Grace is a motivation to live the life that God has called us to live. And Paul makes these statements, he says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Now Paul is saying when, when you pour out, whatever you pour out, you get in return. So you know people who live greedy lives, their lives shrink. And people who live generous lives, as the proverb says, their world gets larger and larger and larger. So when you sow joy and 
peace and kindness into the lives of others, you, you get that back. And when you sow bitterness and anger, you get that back. And Paul is saying that we can't be deceived. We, we gotta recognize God has structured the world in a sense where there is sowing and reaping. And this is very, this is important. This is very different than karma. Karma teaches, well, if you're good, something good's gonna happen to you. This, this is not sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is you pour out and based on the way that God structured the universe, you get back based on what you pour out. And then he continues his thought. He says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature, they will harvest decay from and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. So notice how he's comparing and contrasting. He's saying that when you live a life to please your flesh, when you, when you live a life to do what you wanna do all the time, and you respond to that broken part of you, there's death and decay that comes as a result. But when you live to please the spirit of God, when you wake up every day and you say, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, that there is, in return, there is a harvest of everlasting life that goes from now through all eternity. And Paul is helping us understand we get what we pour out. And when you're pouring out good, when you are pouring out good seed, there are moments in your life where it doesn't go the way that you want it to go. It's almost like you sow, 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 and you don't get any harvest, and you start to wonder, is that law of sowing and reaping really true? And Paul makes a statement, I wanna encourage you, take this verse, write it down, take it to your small groups this weekend, this week, take it into your conversations in the car. This one verse is so crucial for the life of a follower of Jesus. Listen to what he says. He says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. Anybody ever get tired of doing what is good just out of curiosity at all of our campuses? You, you get tired of investing in other people when they don't respond the way that you thought they would. You get tired of pouring out and pouring out. He says, let us not get tired of doing what is good for at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. He's saying that if you persevere through the difficulty, if you continue to put one foot in front of the other when you want to quit, there is a harvest that God is going to bring into your life, a harvest of blessing. Keep showing up. Do not quit. There is good ahead. Now, implicit within this passage, there are three truths that I'd like to share with you. And the first one is this. The first truth is that whatever you're going through right now, this is just a season. There is an expiration date to every season of our lives. I would love to um, show you a picture of my family here. And this picture, if you look at it, this would be a great Christmas card picture. And if you got this picture, you, you might think, oh, that's a really cute family. Maybe you wouldn't think that, but perhaps you would. <laughs> and you would, you would see smiles. But when I look at the picture, I know what happened right before that picture. <laughs> uh, I know that we got all dressed up and my daughter, Karis, who's eight years old, she wanted to take our dog, Mercy, to the park and she wanted to get her in the picture with us. And we decided that right before we would snap the shot with Mercy, we'd let her off leash because we didn't want her leash in the picture. And Mercy got the zoomies and she starts running around and Karis, who struggles with anxiety, is screaming. And thankfully, Stacy, my wife, she has a treat in her hand and she pulls it out and gets Mercy back. And Mercy is not in the picture because she was crazy. You're not in the picture this year, Mercy. But right after that, it's like, all right, everybody, let's smile. <laughs> and we have a great Christmas picture. But when I see that picture, I see so much. I see more than just the situation. I want you to pull that back up. I see 19 years of marriage to my wife that I met the first week of college. I see my 15 year old kid who's in high school and he's trying to figure out what he loves and playing football and lacrosse and struggling with his grades. And I see my middle son, Sammy, that we adopted when he's two years old. And I see my daughter, Karis, and I see seasons. And I see that our family has gone through so many different seasons over the last 20 years. I see that when we first got married, we, we went through a really hard time the first five years of marriage and 
We, we live paycheck to paycheck, struggle to pay our bills while going to grad school. Uh, I see the, the moments before Sammy came that we struggled with infertility and the brokenness of trying and trying and trying to have a kid and then after getting pregnant, having a miscarriage. And I see so much in that picture. And if you were to do the same with your family or with your life, if you were to take a picture, you would know that there's a lot that comes together for one moment. There's so much history that is building. And I hope that you can see there is a truth, there's a reality that when we embrace it, changes the way that we see our seasons. See, in every season of life, there are gifts from God, there's a grind that comes with it, and there are grievances or grief that comes with that season. In every season that you walk through, there are gifts, there's a grind, and there's grief. And when I can understand that God is constantly blessing me with good things, but at the same time in every season, there are gonna be some hard things that I have to endure. It's kind of like for those of you who are young parents, maybe you hold your child in your hands and you think, could it get any better than this? And apparently every grandparent tells me, yes, it can get better than this when they hold their grandkids. But then that night when it's 2 a.m. and the child is whining in the middle of the night and you're trying to change diapers and it's your 15th night of getting two hours of sleep, you think, could it get any harder than this? See, life comes with gifts and it comes with grind and it also comes with grievances because maybe you're at a season of your life where your children are leaving the home and there's a part of that that is attractive, but there's another part of that, there's an emptiness, there's a grief in that, that you're mourning in your relationship with each other and your relationship with God. When I understand this, it gives me the ability to endure, to understand that life flows in seasons. And right now you're in a season. And sometimes when you're in a season, it's really hard to see that that season will ever end. But God today wants you to understand that this too, this grievance, this grievance, this grind that you're in right now, this too shall pass. Peter says in 1 Peter, I want you to hear his words. He says, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That's the good news of Jesus. That no matter where you are in your journey spiritually today, by faith in Jesus, his death on a cross for your sins, his resurrection from the dead three days later, that you can have a relationship with God and you can live in a broken, dying world, a decaying world with living hope because the good news of Jesus. And Peter wants them to understand that this changes the way that you see a trial. See, because of this, there's an inheritance, he says, that is kept in heaven for you, who through faith you are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, he says, in all this, in all your trial, in all your grind, in all your grievances, in this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trial. You can have hope. You can rejoice Here's the truth. It may feel pervasive when you're in it, but it's never permanent. It's never gonna last forever. There's always gonna be a moment where that trial is going to finish and God gives us the hope. God gives us comfort in our trials and one of the ways that he comforts us is to help us understand there's an expiration date. Paul also says, I want you to hear his words. He says, that's why we never give up because we know our bodies, they may be dying, but in the midst of our bodies decaying over the course of our lives, internally, our spirits can be renewed. The in internal man and woman can be renewed by the Spirit of God where you are being formed and shaped, where the character, the nature, the internal part of who you are is growing as your body is getting older and older. He says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. He helps us understand that oftentimes what we do is we walk around with this lens on and all we see is what is right in front of us. But he is saying, lift your eyes, lift your vision to realize that what you're going through right now is small and it's temporary. It's small and temporary compared to what is ahead of you. He says they are producing 
for us a glory from God that vastly outweighs them and will last for all eternity. There's a reward for those who are faithful in trial. So we don't look at our troubles. We, we, we don't narrow our lens down to what we see right here in front of us. But what we do is we fix our gaze. We lift our eyes onto the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things that we cannot see will last forever. I hope today that this truth gives somebody strength in the midst of a season where they want to quit to realize that this is not going to last forever. And in the midst of understanding that God will eventually give an expiration date to our trials, there's another truth that Paul highlights in Galatians 6, 19, and it's this. Every season that you walk through matters. So every season that you walk through in life, there is something that the good God of the universe is doing both in you and through you. God is trying to cultivate in us character. He's trying to form us and shape us, and he will leverage every season of our life to do this. I love James' words in James 1, 2 through 4. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. This is, this is one of the hardest verses for me to embrace. That there are so many moments in life where James is saying there, there's all kinds of trials. There, there's getting stuck in traffic. There's, there are moments where people get on your nerves at work. There, there are times where in your home it's really difficult. And somehow in the midst of that, you're supposed to consider it an opportunity for great joy. Well, why? Well, Paul describes it. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Any of you guys know somebody, don't look around, don't, don't, don't elbow anybody right now, don't make eye contact, but how many of you know somebody that they are like 45, 50 years old physically, but they're like 14 years old emotionally, just out of curiosity? You're like, when you're with them, you're with a teenager. You, you might look like you're 50, but you're 14 internally. And there, there is a sense in which a lot of people grow up physically, but they don't grow up spiritually. So they stay immature. And there are a lot of followers of Jesus that don't have 30 years of following Jesus. They have one year of following Jesus repeated 30 times. There are, there are a lot of people that are married that don't have 40 years of marriage. They have one year repeated 40 times. And that's because when we go through tri trials, if we don't embrace that every season matters, we will miss what God is trying to do both in us and through us in that season. James says, listen to his last part of this. He says, let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So embrace the trial because God is using it to cultivate something in you that changes you and allows you to be used by God. I love thinking of this again in patterns. In fact, there, there's an arc of life, a way that life tends to flow. And I wanna share with you, you can write these down on your notes, I wanna share mega themes that happen in every decade of life. And these come from uh, a great book called The Intentional Father by John Tyson and a mentor of mine by the name of Harold Bullock. And these, these truths, I want you to hear these, these patterns show up in scripture in people's lives. These patterns show up if you watch a person's life through the decades. So when a person is born and they're in their teens, the first thing that they're doing is they're preparing. So the, the, the big theme of the teens is preparation for life. You're preparing to go to college. You're preparing to move out of the home. You're preparing to be able to, you know, maybe pay your bills when you're out of the home, but you're prep, preparing for your 20s. Now, when you get in your 20s, you're training. In your 20s, this is such an important time to read as many books as you can read and find mentors and ask questions and do everything that you can to absorb like a sponge because when you get out of your 20s that are for training, you're gonna go into your 30s, which are for building. And when you get to your 30s, you start to build a life, you build a marriage, you start to build a career. This is the decade that most people buy a home unless they live in Southern California or Northern California. And that happens in your 40s, if at all. But you're, you're building in your 30s. And once you get past your 30s, then you get into a season where you start to master. 40s are for mastering. And you start to master a craft. You, 
You learn over the time in your 30s and in your 20s, your life grows by saying yes. But when you get in your 40s, your life narrows in focus by saying no to the things that God's not asked you to do. So you're learning to master in your 40s, which I'm, I'm 40, by the way. And in addition to that, in parentheses, right next to mastering, you can put the word enduring. Because 40s is a decade where you look back and you've come a long way, but you look forward and you still got a really long way to go. And in that season, this is where more midlife crisis happened than any other season of life in the 40s. Because if you're successful, you realize it doesn't, it doesn't fill that void that you were hoping that it would fill. And then there are a lot of people that they've strived their whole lives and they thought they'd be further along in their 40s than they really are. So they try, they go off, they, you know, they find a new spouse, they get a new career, all, all, that's, all that is destructive. Get a Jeep instead of getting a new spouse. I'm just encouraging you. And there's an endurance part of the 40s. In the 50s, you're harvesting. So now you, you've invested, and I love watching, in particular, there's a generation of people in this church that they have labored for 20 to 30 years in the kingdom of God, and they're in their 50s, and they're loving and serving the next generation, and they're harvesting what they planted with their children, and in ministry, and in the kingdom of God. In the 60s, you're guiding. So now you're starting to come alongside of people and you're encouraging them and you're giving wisdom. And then in your 70s, you're imparting. And this is where the Yodas begin to emerge. That somebody who's walked with God for 40 to 50 years and they've been faithful, that they are now at that place where they're imparting. Their life becomes about imparting to another generation. And then in your 80s, what you start to do is you savor. So somebody who's in their 80s, if they followed Jesus and they've been faithful and they've lived with wisdom, they look back and they thank God for all the good things that he's done in their life. And then when they get to their 90s, when people get to their 90s, they're preparing for death. In every decade, God is doing something in you and through you. This last week, I had the privilege of flying back home where I grew up in Michigan. And my grandpa who is 94 years old, is at the end of his life. And I wanted to get one last chance to be with him. And my grandpa, he, my grandmother passed away close to 20 years ago. So he's, he's been this single man for the last 20 years and a great man. But when I talked to him at the end of his life in the moments that I was with him, uh, I got concerned because my grandpa, he grew up as a, as a Roman Catholic and we know many people who are part of the Catholic Church that are passionate followers of Jesus. But for my grandpa, I do believe that he knows God, he has a relationship with him, but there's still that part of him that doesn't have certainty that he'll spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. And it just broke my heart being in the room with him because he could have that peace. He could, right now in this moment, he could be at the end of his life with a sense of contentment knowing that he's about to cross that finish line. And it reminds me of my wife's grandmother who passed away at 95 years old. Totally different story. Grandmother Cloud, she came, she was like the third generation of pastors. She was a pastor's wife and she was the most godly woman that you will ever meet. And over the course of the decades in her life, she got sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And by the time she finished her life, she was dripping the fruit of the Spirit. Everywhere she went, there was love, there was joy. She was ministering to the people who were taking care of her. They'd come in and they'd give her food and she'd say, oh, thank you, thank you for caring for me. I'm so grateful for another day. She would share the good news of Jesus with the people that were loving on her. And at the end of her life, there was just this aroma, there was a fragrance of the Spirit of God over her life because of her faithfulness. I want that for my life. Anybody else want that? That when you, when you look back at the end, you had been faithful in every season of your life. See, God is at work right now in you and through you. And there is a way in every season that you can miss what it is that God is trying to form and shape in your character. I love this verse from John chapter nine where Jesus is speaking and he says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it's day, for night is coming when no one can work. Jesus is saying that there is a window for all work. 
there's a window for all the work that God wants to do both in you and through you. There's internal work that God wants to do and there's external work that God wants to do through you. And you and I both, we can miss that window. I'll give you an example. In uh, my family, you know, my, my wife is a phenomenal chef and she makes great meals, healthy meals, and I'm so grateful for this. But we have some categories in our home. And I have a question, this is a yes or no, you can respond out loud. If a woman or any person stands in a kitchen and cooks a meal for hours, should they have to clean up the dishes of that meal afterwards, yes or no? <laughs> no, absolutely, you are so brilliant, yeah. That she should not have to, or he should not have to go in the kitchen and clean up the meal. That's a, that's a strong category for me. The, the, if it's the men that are getting the benefit or the benefactor, they should clean up the dishes. Can I get an amen? Amen. So sometimes in um, circles, and maybe when extended family is around, uh, there are often moments where the women will make the meal, and it drives me crazy because after the meal, the men will go and they'll sit on the couch and watch sports. And my blood boils over this, especially when it's my wife. And so on this particular occasion, we're at my house, Stacy makes a great meal, and then a group of men who, uh, I won't mention their names or anything, but they go and they, they sit down and watch sports. And I start helping Stacy, and I'm cleaning up the kitchen, and she can tell on my face. She's like, something's not right, you're mad, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm really mad right now. And she goes, well, you know, you're losing twice. And I said, what? She said, you're losing twice. And I said, why? She said, well, one, because you're miserable while you're doing it. And number two, you are missing what it is that God is trying to do in you right now. You could learn to serve at a higher level right now if you would receive it. And I'm grateful for an honest wife. And there is a truth in that, that oftentimes we are missing twice. We are, we are losing twice because we're miserable due to our situation. And on top of that, we're not receiving the gift of formation that God wants to give to us. There is a window for the work of God, both in you and through you. And I wanna encourage you in your groups this week or when you talk to your friends, ask the question of one another, what season are you in right now? What decade are you in? And what is it that God is trying to cultivate both in you and do through you right now in this season? And that, those two questions, you could chew on them for days and God would give you so much that you could apply into your life personally. There is a window for the work and every season matters. But there's one final truth that I wanna finish on. And this perhaps is the most important thing that I want you to hear today. Number three, whatever it is that you are faithful to today, wherever in your life you are putting your hand to the plow, there is a truth that is, there is always a harvest that is ahead. There is hope that at the end of this trial, there will be a harvest from God. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not get tired of doing what is good, for at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. There is a harvest that God wants to bring into your life in the future that will only happen if you are faithful today. This last year when I turned 40, uh, Stacy and I, we decided that we would run a marathon together. And this decided like a really good idea for us because during COVID, we were, we were going outside and we were doing five mile runs. And a five mile run is great because you can get it done in an hour. You get the endorphins that are going. You can listen to some great music. If you're outside, you got your vitamin D come in and you get done and you feel great after you've kind of built up to that. So because of that, we're like, well, you know, let's run a marathon together to celebrate our 40th birthday. But what people don't tell you when they talk about marathons is they don't tell you that by the time you get done training, it's a part-time job. In fact, there are days where you will go out and your runs are three hours. You're running 18 miles or 20 miles on your long run day before you get to the marathon. Nobody, nobody tells you this. And by the time you get done with your training that day, You've listened to like four Pastor Rick sermons. You, you, you've listened to an audible book. You've gone through all the new worship albums, music. You, like you've listened to it all and you still got like an hour to go. 
And in the midst of this, what happens is the pain in your body starts to rotate around. So your knee hurts and then your back hurts and, and you're exhausted, you're thirsty, and you're like, I, I don't wanna keep doing this. So on the day of our marathon, Stacy and I, we go out and we start running. And about a half a mile in, I start hurting. And because I'm a verbal processor, I look at her and I'm like, I'm hurting, are you hurting? She's like, no, I'm fine. And so for the next 25.5 miles, every half a mile or so, I'd look over at her and I'd be like, my knee hurts, you hurting? No, I'm good. And she's running, smiling the whole way. And she never complains once, never complains. Now this is not a sermon on complaining, so I can be honest with you right now. I can be honest with you always, but it's not a sermon on complaining. So um, when we get to the end of it, I look at Stacy and I say, you didn't, you didn't hurt, you didn't complain, I complained the whole time. Like, how did you do it? And she looks back at me and she says, Andy, your, your mindset is wrong. You, you're thinking of this like a five mile jog, not a 26 mile marathon. And when you're running a marathon, you settle in. And you realize this is not a short race. This is not a sprint. This is a long run. And you let your heart, you let your mind, you let your body settle into the run, knowing that eventually there's a finish line, but it's a long run. And I wanna encourage you, there are some of you that are exhausted because you are looking at your life like a sprint. You just keep sprinting, 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 and you're exhausted. And God is saying that there is a way that you can run, that you run all the way to the finish line where you stand before the living God and you hear the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't have to be among the number of people that quit where it matters most. You can be a person that perseveres. When you frame it knowing that there is a harvest ahead, there is a crown of righteousness for those who endure. There is a reward from your heavenly father for every tear that you cry. In every moment that you pour out and you do good and nobody sees it, the God of the universe sees it and he rewards, he blesses those who are faithful and obedient. So my challenge, my encouragement to you is do not give up. Do not throw in the towel where it matters most. See, the enemy, what he will do to you is he will take all the elements of quitting and he will highlight the benefits of quitting. Oh, if you quit, you won't be so tired anymore. Oh, if you quit, you won't hurt anymore. Oh, if you just give, give in right now, it's gonna be so much easier on you. He'll highlight all the benefits of quitting and he'll diminish all the rewards of perseverance. But your heavenly father, what he wants to do for you today is he wants to lift up the reward of perseverance. He wants you to see an image of yourself that is filled with love and joy and peace, patience, kindness. He wants you to get a vision for your life that in the decades to come, your life can be more fruitful, that the most fruitful years of your life can be in the future, that when you see that, it changes the way you think. See, the pain of quitting, the pain of throwing in the towel, the pain of regret is always greater than the pain of perseverance. Let me say it one more time. The pain of regret is far greater than the pain of perseverance. And God is saying, if you persevere today, I will reward you. But there's only one way that you can do it. There's only one way that you can continue on, continue to show up, and it's with this. See, so often in our lives, we are trying so hard to persevere, but we're doing it in our own power. We're doing it in our own strength. I remember there was a moment last year, and most of you know this, the, the pandemic has been hard on a lot of people. It's been really hard on pastors. And that's why I'm so grateful for Pastor Rick and Kay and their leadership through this very difficult season, their faithfulness. You can pray for your pastor, you can bless them, you can encourage them and it makes a difference because there were so many pastors that were getting shots every direction. No matter what decision you made, somebody disagrees with that decision and they feel complete freedom to tell you about it. And for me personally, there's never been a moment in my ministry where I wanted to quit more than during these last two years. I remember one day I was praying in my time with God and I was just like, God, I am hanging on by a thread. I have, I have nothing left to give. And I remember so 
graciously the spirit of God internally just giving me this word, Andy, you can let go. You can let go. If you let go, there are good hands that will catch you. See, there is a big difference between quitting and letting go. Let me say it one more time. There is a massive difference between throwing in the towel on something that God has asked you to do and wholehearted surrender back to God to say, God, my whole life belongs to you and all I wanna do is please you. All I wanna do is be obedient to you. Thank you for the grace that you have displayed at the cross and the empty tomb, the living hope that I have, and because you've been so good to me, I pray that you would give me the power to persevere in the most difficult moments of my life. I know I'm speaking to somebody today that God is saying, I wanna give you the power to persevere, but what he's asking of you is to say to him, I need help. I need you, God, to step in. I need you to give me the power to persevere. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says that the God of unlimited resources can strengthen you in your internal being to give you the power to persevere. Today, the Spirit of God can give you exactly what you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other so that you can be the kind of person that gets to the end of the race and you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. I wanna lead us now into a moment of response to what God is doing in us. And there are some of you today that you are listening to this message and this is your first time ever hearing this good news about Jesus. And I wanna tell you today that there is an opportunity for you to begin a relationship with God right now in this moment that goes through all eternity. And by faith in Jesus and what he has done for you, his death on a cross, his resurrection, by coming to him and yielding your life to him, you can begin a relationship with God that goes from now through all eternity. And you can do it simply by in your heart making a choice to believe in Jesus and yielding your heart to him. I wanna invite you right now to take that step of faith. I wanna invite us to close our eyes for a moment as we respond to this. And there are some of you today that that is your decision. If that's you, I wanna encourage you, be bold and step across that line of faith and just tell them. You can say a prayer that goes something like this. Father, I receive, Jesus, I receive the gift of life from you. I surrender my whole heart to you. Please forgive me for my sins. I wanna follow you with everything that I am. If that's you, we wanna invite you in just a moment to let us know on your connection card that you've made that decision. Let us know that you are choosing to follow Jesus. You can also text it in New Start to 83,000. But that decision is one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. Others of you today, the Spirit of God is stirring inside of you. And perhaps this is a moment just for you, right where you are, to posture yourself in surrender to say, God, I need you. I need your mercy, I need your kindness, I need your strength, and he wants to step in and give you everything that you need to respond. Father, we're grateful today for this truth that the same God who conquered the grave is available and waiting for us to come. Thank you that the same power that brought Jesus from death to life is available. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and live in us and give us everything that we need to live the life that you've asked us to live. So we call upon you today to give us everything that we need to live the life that you've asked us to live, to persevere when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen.